Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Newsam's Night TV studio and another edition of Inside Media. I'm your host, John Maynard. Well, we're of course coming to you today from the Newsam here on the, in the Pennsylvania Avenue in the heart of Washington, D.C., but sitting next to Pete Hamill, who is synonymous with New York City and New York City journalism, it feels like we could be in the middle of Times Square. Um, Pete is a novelist, journalist, editor, and screenwriter who started his career as a reporter for the New York Post in 1960. His newspaper career would go on for decades at The Post, the New York Daily News, The Village Voice, and New York Newsday. Uh, he was a columnist for both The Post and The Daily News in the heyday of tabloid journalism, and he is also the only person to have been editor-in-chief of both tabloids. Uh, along with his journalism career, uh, Pete is also the author of 20 previous books, including the best-selling novels Forever and Snow in August, and the best-selling memoir and one of my personal favorites, uh, A Drinking Life. Um, his newest book, which we'll be discussing today, is Tabloid City, a riveting uh, novel that evokes the world of tabloid newspapers, uh, certainly during a very perilous time uh, for the newspaper industry, but the book is uh, much more than that, as Pete chronicles an extraordinary drama of one fateful day in the Big Apple. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Pete Hamill. Thank you. Thank you. Pete, the, uh, the book depicts uh, a dying newspaper, a uh, story that has become all too real yeah. in the past few years. Why did you decide to write this book at, at this time? Um, first of all, my age. Okay. <laughs> um, I knew I was going to write it sooner or later, uh, but by the time I might get around to it, I might be dead. <laughs> um, uh, as Malik in the court says, I come from a long line of dead people. Um, <laughs> Uh, or all the papers would, ha would be dead, mm -hmm. and I'd have to explain to certain younger readers there were these things called right. newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But the time, about three years ago, I began to feel a certain melancholy about uh, what was coming, mm -hmm. uh, particularly after the recession hit, advertising began to shrink and dry up, um, and the papers themselves uh, began to physically shrink. Mm -hmm. and you could feel something was happening. Right. But, but you would say this is more than a newspaper novel, uh, newspaper novel correct? Yeah. I mean, you have so many different characters in this book that whose lives intertwine. You have an Iraqi war veteran, a uh, uh, would-be terrorist, a disgraced hedge fund manager. Uh, what's the underlying theme for all these, these characters uh, in this book? Well, the thing that lashes the book together is, is something common to anything you write about New York, mm -hmm. and that is how do you deal with the problem of of uh, loneliness in the most crowded city in the United States. Right. Uh, and some people deal with it. Some people enjoy the richness of solitude. Mm -hmm. um, and others don't. It can drive some people mad. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, as a, as a police reporter, just a kid wandering around New York, and as a New Yorker, mm -hmm. um, you would see that, that the solitaries were sometimes the most dangerous people mm. in town. Mm -hmm. the, the loner, as they usually use the shorthand to describe. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get a sense of that, but not only that, right. but to, to deal with the characters who end up in tabloids, mm -hmm. because tabloids at their best uh, are about the local. Mm -hmm. They start with the local. And particularly, uh, the, the appearance of drama, which means conflict, of course, is mm -hmm. the classical understanding of how you build drama. Uh, they're not about analysis. They're not about the sisal crop in Malaysia. Uh, they're not dealing with some of the things on the inside pages of the Wall Street Journal. They're about people one at a time, usually, mm -hmm. and their victims. Right. Right. Well, let's get into the tabloid itself, and I'm a former newspaper person, so uh, my favorite character is uh, Sam Briscoe, the, 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 the gruff editor of the, the, Newark, the New York World tabloid, which is, uh, he's struggling to, to survive in the digital age. Uh, is that character modeled after anyone in particular? Uh, is it you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of me yeah, there, okay. <laughs> or, or maybe a lot, depends on how my friends read it. Right. But it, it, it also was a character based on people I had known. Uh, my own editor, first editor at the Post, Paul San, 
was very much like me. He had never gone to college. He had never done any of that. He was a classical apprentice mm -hmm. in a newspaper to learn a craft that's teachable. Um, and a couple of other people thrown in, but a lot of the characters in the book are composites. It's a, it's a work of the imagination, not of, uh, not an essay right. uh, in which you name right. people. Right. Uh, so it's a combination of Tell us about Helen Loomis, the, the, the rewrite man, as, as yeah, she's called. She was proud of the, 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 when people started calling her the best goddamn rewrite man in New York, she would love that. And yeah. when the, the language police arrived in the late 60s, early 70s, and tried to um, get her to uh, be described as a rewrite person, mm -hmm. She said, nah, one <laughs> syllable too long. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. she was concerned about the rhythm of a sentence. And, right, right. But it, it, there were a couple of women like her because I worked at, at the New York Post when it was owned by Dorothy Schiff. Mm. So there were more women on the staff uh, doing work that was not considered women's work. The, they were not doing the style section. They were covering homicides mm -hmm. and fires like other people. So there were, were more than one people, one person went into the character of Helen Loomis. Of course, in the book, Helen Loomis has to go outside now to have her, her cigarette. Yeah. Um, talk about the difference between newsrooms back then and in the, when you were growing up in their 60s and, and, and the yeah. newsrooms today. Well, the, news, the newsrooms were, first of all, they were noisier because the AP ticker was going <laughs> over on the side. And it was typewriters. Mm -hmm. So there was clack, 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 which turned into like an artillery barrage <laughs> at the Battle of the Somme just before the deadline as everybody hammered away. But the general atmosphere was bohemian. The newspaper men couldn't afford to live in the suburbs. Uh, they lived, all lived in the city. They were a wonderful crowd, the men and the women, the worst husbands in the history of marriage. Um, they were always getting thrown out by their sensible wives and ending up in hotels where they got cheap rates. They were obscene. Uh, everybody smoked and put ash with cigarettes out on the floor. It was paradise. Uh, and uh, I, I loved it. I have a photograph of this old city room around the, you know, hanging over my desk, a uh, vision of heaven. <laughs> and what, what was important about it journalistically was that ideas banged against each other. You know, a, a guy working in sports would come up with a good idea for a political reporter who was based at City Hall or something. Mm -hmm. They were colliding with each other and bouncing off and feeding each other uh, in ways that you can't just do with email. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have to be standing at a, at a water fountain. So Helen Loomis, who uh, grew up with smoking, uh, when they have a big climactic story on the night of the book, uh, she's called back in to do the main story. Uh, and. Sam Briscoe, the editor, says, tell Helen she can smoke. <laughs> and then she came back yeah. from home. Right, right. Um, well, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about your career. Uh, you started writing for The Post in 1960. What, what got you started uh, in journalism? What, what was the decision process? There? Well, I, I loved the idea of journalism. I read a lot of newspapers, but I never finished high school, which is one of the attractions to some of the editors that finally hired me. Um, although last year I finally got my high school diploma from Regis High School in New York, 59 years after I dropped out, because the Jesuits are slow with this stuff, you know. Um, but I, some newspaper movies I loved. I loved uh, His Girl Friday. I loved Deadline USA, the best newspaper movie of them all, photographed in the composing room of the New York Daily News, by the way. And so I knew all the 
main names in newspapers are reading them, mainly sports, but others too. And Jimmy Wexler, who was the editor of the Post, put out a book and I wrote him a long letter uh, praising part of it and complaining about other parts of it. And he called me, he sent me a letter and said, uh, come on in, mm -hmm. I'd love to meet you. Mm -hmm. And I go in and he, he said, have you ever thought about becoming a newspaper man? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, from time to time, but Roman Holiday was another one because Gregory Peck was a newspaper man in Rome mm -hmm. with a bed that folded into the wall and he never worked. Yes. <laughs> and he had the, uh, Audrey Hepburn into the, into the bargain. So I said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to try it. And so he gave me a tryout. And it was the usual summer tryouts, mm -hmm. where one, one time Eleanor Roosevelt recommended an opera singer on a tryout. So he'd write a paragraph and go, oh, you know, until people said, we can't have this. And three, or four, three months later, I was hired. Mm -hmm. It was always a, a tryout under guild regulations, but at fun, some point they had to hire you and they, they finally hired me. When I got my press card with my name on it, I wore it to bed for a month, <laughs> like dog tags. <laughs> but it was a great chance thing. You know, luck and chance play more parts in our lives than, than most of us realize. Mm -hmm. You, you, you jumped around quite a bit uh, in New York, uh, working at the Post, uh, the Daily News, and was it a bigger, less of a deal, big deal then to, to jump newspapers uh, back in the 60s and 70s? Or no. Was it like it, going from the Yankees to the Mets? Or no, yeah. never. It never worked that yeah. way. Um, what happened was that there were seven papers, of which three were afternoon papers, uh, but the, the papers represented options. You know, I remember one guy at the Post who got drunk and threw a typewriter out a window <laughs> onto West Street. Nobody, fortunately, was walking by. And within two days, he was working up the block <laughs> at the Journal American. And later, the Times, when Abe Rosenthal came in, mm -hmm. they began hiring tabloid people away. Mm -hmm. Sam Roberts, Clyde Haberman, all started on tabloids to put some juice into the paper. Uh, but then as the papers started going out of business, it became a little more mm -hmm. dicey. Mm -hmm. You know, you, d you didn't have many options. Mm -hmm. right. People can be dismissive of, of tabloids uh, today and even back then, but I mean, what do you say to the naysayers? First of all, do you, do you still read the, the New York tabs uh, every, every yeah. day? Mm -hmm. When I'm there. Yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what do you say to the naysayers of, of tabloids? No, the tabloid is the shape of the paper. Mm -hmm. You know, that, it, it depends what's done with the shape of that paper. Right. The Daily News, for all the way back to its beginning in 1919, although it had real pop in the headlines and so on, if you looked at the clips, it was very straightforward reporting. Mm -hmm. um, the same with the Post. And it, it, it was hard to look down on a form that had Murray Kempton as one of its stars. Mm -hmm. It was like having Henry James in the city room or something. Right. Uh, and later, other people, including Nora Ephron and others who came into the post mm -hmm. to really begin their lives, as I did there, my grown-up life. Mm -hmm. um, so th basically, the editors at the post and at the news uh, wanted to put out papers that nobody had to apologize for. Mm -hmm. Later, they got a little cartoon-like, mm -hmm. you know, a little too Fleet Street for my taste, mm -hmm. a little too many dames in bikinis on page three with, when you, you, you need the space. The news hole is already shrinking right. and you're doing this brainless stuff. Right. Um, but still, you, there, there's some, some very good people still working at tabloids. Right. Um, you have a character uh, in the book who was uh, fired from the newspaper and ends up writing a blog, basically criticizing that newspaper and, and other, the, the industry in general. Uh, do, you, do you read the blogs? Uh, do you have any favorites? What are your, what are your opinions? Um, I don't there? really. You know, mm -hmm. I go, I, the, the internet websites I look at are the Daily Beast. I look mm -hmm. at Truth Dig, Robert Shears, Left Wing 
I guess it's a blog, but I wouldn't call it a blog. Mm -hmm. To me, most of the blogs are, are therapy, not journalism. Okay. You know, it's people trying to get it out of their skulls before they kill again. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, but I, the, the, the internet, the straight internet journalism, when I'm away, when I'm here, for example, I can't get a New York yep. Times, I go online. Right. You know? right. um, and when I'm in New York, I can get the Washington Post yep. you know, online. Um, it's much better that way than the way it used to be. You had to go to the out-of-town newsstand yeah. in 42nd Street to get a Boston Globe. Now you can get it. Yeah. You're currently, a, Pete's also a distinguished writer in residence of journalism at, at New York University. Um, and so you interact with students. So what, do you, what do you tell them about the future of journalism? Because we were talking earlier, they, they, they're, still, they're still out there. There's still students there that, that want to practice journalism. Well, when they ask, which is not too often about the future, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, these are kids who were 10 when September 11th happened, mm. you know. Um, but in general, I'm optimistic, and I, 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 what I tell them basically is journalism is journalism. Get it right. Get more than one source. Mm -hmm. Make the prose as handsome as you can make it. Um, uh, don't dash it off. Don't write like you're double parked. Um, and I believe strongly that there'll be a future of uh, online of journalism because uh, most of us now know that about between 60 and 70 percent of the cost of putting out a newspaper is for paper, ink, and trucks mm -hmm. to deliver it, the delivery system as they call it. Mm -hmm. And it's much different online. The thing is to professionalize the internet, and that's underway. So I look at certain things, but, um, but I think the younger generation from looking over shoulders in the subways and so on is, is thumbing away, I hope, looking at you know, news. I don't think they're reading Madame Bovary online, <laughs> but at eight o'clock in the morning. But, but I, I do, th feel from knowing them better, because I didn't know anybody 22 mm -hmm. anymore, mm -hmm. uh, that they have the passion, they want to be good at something, they want to be able to help people, yep. help people who've been knocked down to get up. Mm -hmm. um, and I, they're not, they're only vaguely interested in in getting rich or famous or any of that, all the things that will never happen if you want them. <laughs> you know, you never get rich in the newspaper business. But uh, that passion is the thing that has touched me about them and made me optimistic. And it's, it, the, that optimism is sort of in the book. We do want to apologize about my phone, by the way. Uh, but we do want to get to the um, questions. If anyone does have a question, please just raise your hand. We do have some volunteers here. I, oh, we have a question right here in the front here. Oh, I wrote a lot of politics. Yeah, I covered conventions. I covered elections in New York and um, down. Spent time down here getting tear gassed in the '60s, and uh, I, which was kind of politics. But the '60s was an interesting period because the culture and politics and uh, really began to mesh. You know, big arena rock and roll. Covering that was as much as it was as important as covering the Democratic Convention. It was a different aspect of the same thing. But I never wanted to be a, a, a specialist. I didn't want to be a political columnist for the rest of my life, any more than I'd want to be a sports writer mm -hmm. for the rest of my life, because I knew that the first two or three World Series I would cover would be fun, but the 27th would drive me nuts. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, in terms of the, the politics, um, uh, it was m you had much greater access in the old days, much less uh, packaging of candidates into whatever they think they are. Uh, you could sit at the bar with, with a candidate sometimes and after everything was over and hear things, off the record at least, that would at least make you laugh. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now it's a much blander, controlled, uh, performed profession, it looks like to me. I, I wanted to, if you have visited our news history gallery on the uh, fifth floor, we have a, a section on tabloids, and we have on display a, a classic New York, front, uh, New York Post front page that reads, Headless Body in Topless Bar. I'm not sure if you've all seen that <laughs> New York Post headline, but I wanted to ask you about those, those, you know, the great New York Post, New York Daily News headlines. Who comes up with those, and what are some, do you have any great ones from your past? Well, it, 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 there's so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> Just in the last 10 days, well, a, a certain New York politician yeah. has led to some of the, <laughs> the, you know. Yeah. Um, They've been having fun with that, that's for sure. You know, yeah. I, yeah. but there were many. I mean, I have on my wall, Headless Body with Topless right. Bar. Um, and, uh, but we also had uh, Ford to City Drop Dead. It was a daily news one. Right that was a big hit at the time. Right. We once had a story in the Daily News when I was editing it about some job that had been done rehabbing a street in which they narrowed the sidewalk but left the fire pump out in the street. <laughs> so the headline with the photograph was, duh, <laughs> question mark. Right. Uh, there's there's a, a, one of my favorites is, a, is the one uh, before I became a newspaper man, when the Dodgers finally beat the goddamn Yankees in the World Series in 1955, and the page one was, who's a bum? You know, yeah. 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 that wasn't the New York Times style. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who is responsible for the headlines in, in, uh, in for the, is it the copy desk? Is it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, copy desk, and there were special guys there. Yeah. One of the great ones at the Daily News was a guy named Pete Skyko, who was a great newspaper man. And he could do other stuff, mm -hmm. but he was great thinking in headlines. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, as some of those guys began to take the money and go, to take the buyouts to mm -hmm. be able to leave, uh, they didn't train another generation of people that way. So a lot of what I think is happening is a, a caricature of the tabloid headline of the old days right. that were wittier, I thought. We have a question down in, over there, yeah, and then down in front. So we'll do it over there and then there, yep. When can I expect to receive the last delivery of a morning newspaper to my house? <laughs> oh, I think, they'll, I, I think they'll go on for a long time, uh, but it'll be like, stick shift and automatic transmission. They'll, they'll work at the same time, depending on the audience, but I, I think it'll be 30 years at least, unless all the f trees in Canada burn down or something, and there's no newsprint left. Mm. But I think they'll, they'll go on, but I think the power of the internet and, uh, is, is gonna be pervasive. Right there in front. Uh, line blurring between tabloid and other papers. Question, the influence of Rupert Murdoch on the Wall Street Journal, which is becoming more and more tabloid style. Any comments on that? Well, I, I'm one of the people who thinks actually the paper is, the Wall Street Journal is better since Murdoch. It's more readable. There's less jargon printed financial uh, and, and business jargon in the copy, mm. printed without explanation. You know, no uh, derivatives, comma, explaining, comma, and go on with it because, I mean, that's what partly led to the, the, the collapse of everything. The, the, the newspaper men covering it couldn't understand the language. The regulators definitely couldn't understand the language. It was some invented language that a handful of people created. So I think it's been better under him. Um, I know that's heresy to say that Murdoch actually improved the paper. Um, but I, it, 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 he knows better than to try to make the Wall Street Journal into the Post. He's not gonna do that, ever. He had a good paper in, in uh, Australia called The Australian that was very good for years, a broadsheet. I think we have a question. Yep, three rows up there. Terrific. 
You started to make a comparison between the newsroom of the 60s and the newsroom of today, and then somehow you got sidetracked. I'd be interested in your comments about the newsroom of today and the impact that has had on the quality of the hard news reporting in the papers. Well, I, I think, first of all, it's emptier. And that's not because of job losses alone. The photographers who go out and cover things and who were always part of the infantry, they, would, they could cover five stories in a day, knew more about what the city was than some reporters who only covered one story that day. They never come in anymore. They can file photographs in the trunk of their car. <laughs> they never come into the <clears throat> office. The sports writers don't come in at all anymore. Uh, for whatever reason, and when I go dropping in on friends at the... And what I was explaining earlier was that the, the way different sensibilities and different specialties blend and through just saying hello in the morning and getting off on the, the elevator and say, what are you up to? And then hearing things, I, I think that's fading away a bit right now. You can't do it all by email. Um, the well, the impact to me is, is, is less a sense, um, a lessened sense of, of the city. It, it, you're not getting a wide enough variety of, a, a wide enough amount of input from people who live in different places. The staff would, didn't live in uh, newspaper housing. They were all over the city uh, in New York, and I'm sure here. Um, so I think you're losing some of that right now. And it's, it's a very important role of the tabloid in particular to explain to the older people who these new arrivals are and to explain the city to those new arrivals. My father became an American not by reading the Federalist Papers or de Tocqueville, he got it from reading the sports pages of the Brooklyn Eagle and the Daily News. And once he got baseball, he was an American. <laughs> uh, my mother never got it. She, she didn't know, a, she was too busy. Uh, she didn't know a bunt from a bat. Um, but I think that sense is, is being lost. You begin to see Mexicans living in a place as a problem as part of some rant that you've had to explain to somebody that maybe Glenn Beck doesn't know any Mexicans. Uh, and you, you're not getting a sense of what they're bringing to the city, uh, what, they, what they're giving us, the way all the previous immigrants had left traces of it, um, of themselves. You know, the Irish didn't leave any influence on food, thank God. Uh, <laughs> But what, what would we eat in New York if the Italians had not shown up? Uh, what would we call people if the uh, Eastern European Jews hadn't given us Yiddish? You know, what would we call a schmuck if we didn't have the word schmuck? And they're all over, sometimes in the wood, <laughs> sometimes on page one. Uh, so I think there's less of that. I, I, I see stories in both tabloids with like nine bylines in an eight paragraph story. And that means it's a lot of interns, you know, you know, writing little bits and pieces of it, but nobody experiencing the whole story in some way. And I think that will be a phase, but I, it's, it's something that uh, bothers me because I didn't have to go through that as a, as a young kid trying to learn it. Uh, I, had, I worked on an afternoon paper to begin with. I could go out and cover a murder at 2 o'clock in the morning, get back in time to write it for the first edition, mm -hmm. which closed at 8 a.m. Now kids are phoning in bits and pieces, and they weave them together in the rewrite desk. Um, I, I just want, in, in your press materials for the book, I, I was struck by uh, a question that you were asked about the importance of the nap. Um, <laughs> Tell us how uh, naps uh, assist you in your writing. Well, it was something I learned when I, yeah. when I, at the beginning of, when I first started writing a novel in 1967, and by then I was working days yeah. <laughs> at last. Um, 
that I had garnered a whole lot of tricks in my hands, and I don't mean deceptions. I mean the the ability to say something in 700 words and right. under deadline pressure. Um, but when I had a novel of 120,000 words to deal with, it was coming out like journalism, so I started writing longhand on yellow pads, and I still do that today. I do that, uh, I don't mean I write the whole book, but I write four or five pages, then put it on the computer, right. which gives me a second draft right away on those pages, and sometimes the momentum takes you along a little bit. Mm -hmm. But what the, to get back to the nap, <laughs> to get the newspaper out of my skull and the other stuff into my subconscious at least, I learned the great joy of the nap because it, first of all, it gives you two mornings. <laughs> you know, you wake up here, geez, here's another morning. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that allowed me to go back to, to doing the other work I wanted to do uh, more fresh. And oddly enough, the subconscious sometimes helps you a lot when you're writing fiction. You know, you can go with, your character could do three th different things. You go to bed saying, oh, geez. but when you wake up, you know exactly what he should do or she should do. So th those of you who would like to write, practice the nap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice. I still do it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we've run out of time. Uh, Pete Hamill, thank you so much for appearing thank with us you. today here on Inside Media. Thank you very much. And again, Pete will be uh, just outside the, uh, the studio here uh, uh, signing books and you, where you can also purchase a copy. Thank you for joining us here Thank today. you for coming. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. That, that was, was fun. That was fun. That was yeah. fun.